God knows our deepest needs and pains and addresses them, and he won't let us go. I'm glad you're here for Mother's Day. I'm glad you're, but not moms, right? Moms, moms, they just feel that in a way that's unique and different. That pain that moms experience when our kids lash out at them, man, it, it is deep. They feel their mistakes in a way that, that nobody else does, right? I remember one time I was, um, over the years, I've had an opportunity to work with a lot of couples and a lot of families. One time I was working with a, a mom and her daughter because they were just in a really bad uh, turmoil in their relationship. And mom contacted me and said, hey, can we sit down? I'd love help with, with my daughter. I won't tell you her name. So, But um, we were sitting there talking, and it had been an hour and a half, you know, of kind of working through the pain, working through the resentment, working through the anger, all the things that they'd experienced and all this stuff. And I thought that we were at a point in this conversation where I'm like, everybody's being nice. They're laughing together some. And they're kind of, they feel like there's like some, they feel like there's a little forgiveness in the air. And, and I learned something really quickly. There's some nodding heads I can see already, right? But I learned something really quickly in counseling. Never ask a, a question you don't know the answer to. Because I leaned forward and I said, I, I was really wanting to just go home, you know, and getting done. And I felt like we were getting somewhere. And I leaned in and I said, you know, looked at the teenage girl. I said, you know, the truth is though, right? I mean, I know you've got a lot of hurt and I know you've experienced some really tough times and, and I know this, that you've, you really get mad at mom. But at the end of the day, you really love her, don't you? And I thought, this is going to be great. And I leaned back and she looked at her mom. She looked back at me and she goes, no, I hate her. I think she's a B. I'm like, well, guess we get to start over. You're like, you know, like how is this tension, you know? And I'm like, wow, this wasn't just lashing out in anger. This was like this moment that could have been used to repair so much. And she, can you imagine how deeply that hurt her mom? They have a great relationship today. But I don't, she really ever worked through forgiving her daughter. I mean, she's grown up now. She's got kids of her own. She's probably experiencing a lot of that with four-year-old twins and all this stuff. But, but the truth of it is, she probably, mom probably never really worked through to forgive that. She got over it because it's what moms do. Moms get over it and they, they grow up. But what happened wasn't forgiveness. What happened was just scar tissue built up around that wound. And mom probably still to this very day carries that wound with her. But man, what would happen if she were free of that? What would happen if she, would, if she were able to express everything? But instead, we feel guilty for feeling it, right? We feel guilty even for being angry. But I want you to know something. When you are hurt, it's okay to be angry. It is okay to be angry. Moms are like, yes, preach, right? Bring it, let's go. Like, it's okay to be upset. Even scripture says it. Ephesians chapter 4, Jesus, or Paul's given us some instructions on, on what to deal with and how to do some stuff. And he says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. He says, don't sin by letting anger control you. Anger is reasonable. Paul was angry. Jesus was angry. God's angry at times in scripture. But anger is not the sin. It's when anger controls you that we have an issue. Now, here's the deal that I want us to understand. Anger is the cauterizing heat that lets the wound of, that needs to be healed. Anger is the cauterizing heat that heals the wound or closes it up so that it can heal over. This sounds unrelated, but I love Dr. Pimple Popper. Okay, anybody like Dr. Pimple Popper? Pimple videos, anybody? Okay, yeah, oh yeah, for real, right? Okay, some people like the lipomas. You don't know what a lipoma is? It's like a chicken breast that pops out of somebody. They cut it up and bloop all at once. Not fun. I don't like those. I like the cysts because they cut them open. This is gross. You know, like squish it out. And it's like, I don't know, it's like some sort of like gooey stuff, toothpaste that looks like skin cells that are, I love that. It's gross. I know it's so sicky. You know, they get it all squeezed out and then there's like a sack. Okay. I forget. But it's crazy. But the, the other day I was watching it and she was popping what they called hydrocystomas. And they're these like little fluid filled sacks. Okay. You can imagine this tiny fluid filled sack, you know, like the, maybe the size of a pea all around this lady's eyes. And, and they had to take, she took the scalpel and she had to 
open up the little fluid-filled sack and drain the fluid out. Now, that's what all of us would do probably at home in the mirror, right? You take a pin and figure it out and you have black eyes or whatever. But, but she did that. And then there's an important step that was next. She took this this tool, right? And it's hooked up and it's, and it's basically like a little rod that has a, a tiny electrode at the end of it. And she used that and it creates, it just makes this pop and it creates an immense amount of heat in a very short amount of time. And it goes pop. And she was able to use that heat to cauterize the very bottom of the sack so that it wouldn't just fill up with fluid again. Because otherwise, the, she would drain the fluid out, the little sack would heal back up, the fluid would just come back in there. And so she used it to cauterize so that that one wouldn't come back again. Anger is like that in us. Anger is the cauterizing heat that heals up the wound so that we can, so that we can move on. But be careful with it, right? Because just like that heat, too much of it, for too long, you can get third degree burns. You can do more damage with the anger. If it's there for too much of it or too long, you can do more damage than you started with when, in the beginning. Anger is not a bad thing, but we can't let anger control us. We have to allow anger to be useful to us as we move forward. Because when we keep the too much heat for too long, man, that, that unforgiveness bitterness, anger, all that tension builds up inside of us. And then what happens? It steals our joy. And we know it. I mean, if you've ever lived in any level of like, I can't forgive my husband. I can't forgive my wife, my friend. I can't forgive my sister or my brother-in-law, or I can't forgive my dad, or I can't forgive my whoever. If you've lived with that, it sucks the joy out of life, doesn't it? Now, there's this show, and I can't remember the name of it. I keep having to ask people to remind me. But, but there's this little lady. She talks about organizing, tidying up. Have you seen Tidying Up? How many of you have seen Tidying Up? It's, it's a terrible show. Okay, but so dumb because all it does is make to-do lists for me. Okay, like, I think that at the end of it, in the credits, they say, here's the to-do list for Jeremy. Okay, so, but like you watch the show, and it's this lady who comes in, and she's very, she's very sweet and quiet Asian lady, and she tells you, to go into your closet and one piece at a time to take pieces out of your closet and ask yourself, does this spark joy? I don't know. I, I, I don't get it, right? I, I, like, I wear my clothes and I like them and they're fun and whatever. I don't know that they spark joy. I, I like this jacket. It, I don't know if it sparks joy, but I like it because it hides my gut, you know? <laughs> and like, I don't know if that's joyful or what, but I, I mean, I kind of like wearing it because... I, I feel skinnier, you know? And you know what another thing I like is, I, I don't know if you guys have these, but watch this. I love these jeans. I got these. When I wore, when I, first time I put these things on, I'm like, I felt like Nacho Libre. You know, like, like I'm like, they're, they're flex pants. They had this thing on them, flex pants. So I came home and I told Sheila, I'm like, look, these are awesome. And she goes, yeah, they're stretch pants. I'm like, no, they're flex pants. Flex pants are different. These, they flip. Look at this. They flex and they snap back. And she said, yeah, they've, yeah women have had them for years. <laughs> so I'm like, so you're telling me for decades, women have had this kind of joy. <laughs> and you're not sharing them with me. You know, like your whole, women as a gender have held out on us, men, And I'm just a little bitter and angry about it, okay? Like, you've been hiding. This is amazing, right? This is fantastic. So, like, I'm going to have to work through this. So, men, if you were thinking, I I don't have anybody to forgive. You could have had that for years, okay? But they didn't share it with us. But here's the thing that we have to understand. That when we live in unforgiveness, that's exactly what it does. It just steals away our joy. And we have to look to our freaking clothes to get joy. Like, like, that's ridiculous because God wants you to be free of that stuff. So I want you to understand way better than giving you a, a t-shirt or a trinket or a flower. And I want you to know that you could find the joy that unforgiveness has stolen from you. Because what scripture says is in your anger, don't sin. Don't, let, don't sin by letting anger control you. And he goes in this, and don't in doing so, the next part of that verse, in doing so, give the devil a foothold. Anger is the example. 
He's just showing, like, when you do things that don't set you free, those things are what the enemy uses to grab a hold of your foot, to grab a hold of your ankle. And he's never, ever satisfied with a foothold. The enemy doesn't want a foothold. The enemy doesn't want a leg hold. The enemy doesn't want a leg bar. The enemy wants a full-on body slam where you're pinned up and, and curled up where you have absolutely no way to move because here's the thing that we have to get is that once he's stolen your joy and anger begins to control you, he has you exactly where he wants you because he's in control of your anger instead of his, your anger, you being in control of it. So understand something. When we allow anger, bitterness, and unforgiveness to creep in. It steals our joy and gives the devil a foothold, and he will constantly use that foothold to leverage us, to leverage us to more slavery to him. You feeling less joy? Are you feeling less freedom? Are you feeling like you just got this weight on you of anger and bitterness and resentment and there's this part of you that just you can't even name it's just rolling around in you and it, it's so deep inside of you that you can't figure out how to express it jesus wants us to be free from that because it's freedom that sets us free it's the freedom jesus didn't die just so that you could go to heaven do you know that, that that's a, a complete misnomer in scripture we have this idea that Jesus died so I could go to heaven. Jesus died, didn't die just so that you could go to heaven. Jesus died so that you could go to heaven because he wants you to have a free life, a life free of anything holding you back. And when we choose to live in unforgiveness, we choose to hold on to life, right? We take the pain, the trauma that someone else put me in, and we wrap it around us. And we live in it, right? We live bound up by it. And Jesus never imagined this holding us back. This was never his plan. His plan was freedom. Scripture says that it's for freedom's sake that Jesus said it's free. He didn't just die on a cross so that you could go to heaven. He died on a cross so that you didn't have to have anything holding you back because he loves you that much. He loves you so much that he died so that you could have life. He said that. I came to give them abundant life, right? Not life tethered off to someone else. But you know what? When we look at scripture, there are more than a hundred verses in, throughout the Bible that talk about forgiveness, being forgiven, forgiving people. And we feel like there's an obligation, don't we? We feel like we're supposed to forgive. So we are like, well, I guess I have to forgive because even Jesus' prayer says it, right? It says that we should forgive those their trespasses as, as we've been forgiven our trespasses? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? But you know, in all 100 verses of scripture, more than 100 that talk about for being forgiven or forgiving other people, you know, not one single time does it tell you how to forgive. Is that a little frustrating? Is it okay to be frustrated with the Bible? It seems like it is. It seems like even if it's not okay, I feel like I'm frustrated with the Bible anyways. Because I want to know how to forgive because I'm tired of having this everywhere, right? I'm tired of dragging all of this stuff around with me. I just want to know how. But I want you to know something. I think there are two reasons why Jesus doesn't tell us how to forgive. If I were to try to tell you in a 30-minute sermon how to forgive someone who hurt you as deeply as you've been hurt, do you think I could do a good job of it? Because it would come off trite, it would come off simple, and it would come off cheap, right? You'd be like, yeah, that's cute, if they, all they did was like back up over my tricycle. You know, like, yeah, that's great, it's cool that it spells a word and all, but, but don't you think that it's a little deeper than that when someone's the victim of childhood sexual trauma? Don't you think it's a little more intense than that? when someone's been betrayed in an affair? Don't you think that I deserve, as a person who is hurt, don't you think I deserve a little more than you giving me three quick things and a poem and closing it out, right? I mean, that would be the most terrible injustice that could be done. Which more do you think God feels your pain to know that you have experienced something so deep and painful to you? 
He wouldn't, tri- never would trivialize that with just a couple of verses on how to forgive. Flip switch A, move the dial to position B. No, because it's personal. Think how unique you are. I mean, on the face of the earth right now, there's 7.3 billion people. None of them are like you. You may resemble one or two or 20, but none of them are exactly like you. You are unique among all of those. And you're unique among all of the people, not only the 7.3 billion that are on the earth now, but all of the people who have inhabited earth over the last 6,000 years, you're unique. And so is the person who hurt you. They're unique. Their choices are unique. Their story is unique. Their way they think is unique. The thing that they did from them to you is so unique that it can't possibly be reproduced. You can find some commonalities. You can find some shared experiences, but you'll never find everything being exactly the same because what was done to you was only done to you. So here's the deal. Jesus would never trivialize your pain by trying to summarize how to get out of this in a couple of silly verses, little tiny things, right? Here's the other thing. The second reason you'll not find a single verse about about how to forgive is this, that Jesus doesn't want you to read about how to forgive. Jesus wants to enter into your life and talk with you in relationship. He wants to personally talk you through you forgiving what happened to you in your life. Forgiveness isn't generic. Forgiveness is insanely personal. It's something that only you can experience. And so let me just say this. This is the reason why we say that religion is completely worthless and that this is a relationship with Jesus because we're not talking about a relationship with him only through his word. He wants to work in your life and speak directly to the healing that you need to experience in your heart and only that is unique to you. It's not something that we can talk about for everybody. But we've got to get to a place where we can get rid of this. So we have to understand what forgiveness is. So I can help you with this part of it. Forgiveness is realizing that I've been holding on to the, to the steel. Like to, I've been holding on to the steel tether of trauma that you hooked into me. I've been holding on to the steel trether, tremor, tether, steel tether of trauma that you hooked into me. And that I've been using it to drag you through my mess. Forgiveness is realizing that I've been using this to drag you through my mess in a misguided effort to get you to experience my pain or to make you pay for something that you can't possibly pay for. Isn't that sad? I use this to drag you through my pain because you hurt me and I drag you through my pain to try to get you to feel something I feel or pay a penalty or a cost that you can't even understand. And here's the thing, that I had to realize something, that me holding on to this doesn't put you in prison. I'm the one who's captive. This doesn't affect you at all. It doesn't even, it doesn't have anything. I'm the only one hurting from holding on to this. So we have to understand a few things about, about this whole idea because Jesus wants to set us free. The first thing we've got to understand is that freedom, forgiving people, doesn't mean you're just saying it's okay. You're not just writing it off. You're not just going, well, don't worry about it. I'll just, I'll just try not to pull on this so much. Freedom, forgiveness comes to us when we realize that this isn't helping that me holding you hostage isn't setting me free. I mean, I know it's not difficult to understand that me holding you hostage, I'm the one being held hostage. You don't even know about it. So I have to recognize that, that forgiveness realizes that holding you hostage is not setting me free. That's important. The second thing it does is that forgiveness realizes that you are more than just that one thing. Let me just illustrate this. I'm going to take this off so we can understand it. Let me just help you with this. Would you think of the worst thing you've ever done? I mean, the worst day, like the very worst choice you made, the very worst thing you've ever done in your whole life. What, that one thing, you're not going to have to tell anybody. Don't worry about it. It's okay to think about it. Like, the worst thing you've ever done. 
Aren't you more than that? But hold on a second, Jeremy, you're, you're saying, right? What that person did to me is way worse than the thing I've ever, the worst thing I've ever done. I would never even consider doing what they did. And I've done some things wrong, but that's way worse. Okay, so how about the 10 worst things that you've ever done? All focused into one moment and drilled out, right? In one time, all, take the 10 worst things, the worst way, and put them together and push them out. You're like, yeah, we're still not even close. How about 100? How about 1,000? How about the, the top 1,000 worst things that you've ever done in your life? The things that no one knows, right? What if, what if you took all 1,000 of those and pushed them down like a laser and shot them out all at one time? Are we getting close? Maybe a million? How about we did this? Just, let's just do this. How about if we took every bad thing, every terrible choice, everything you've ever, ever done in your life that was wrong at all, and you focused it into one action? Can I ask you this question? Aren't you more than that still? I mean, it's the very reason that you walk through the doors, and I can with confidence say that at Journey Church, we love you exactly where you are, and we care more about your next step than we do your last one. We don't care what yesterday had. We don't care what you did in the parking lot on the way in the door. We care about where you're headed far more than where we've been. Why? Because you're more than that. You're more than the bad choices you've made. You are so much more valuable than that. And here's the deal. Forgiveness realizes that about the other person. I know that's hard to do. I mean, I get it. I'm a victim of childhood sexual trauma. It's not particularly easy to say he's more than that. But he is. So forgiveness realizes that that person is not defined by that one moment any more than you are defined by yours. And here's the, the truth of it. This is the very reason that when you walk through the door, if you walk through the doors of journey and, and you're gay, it's the reason why you're not gay Jim to me. There's nobody named Jim, right? But like, it's the reason why you're not gay Jim. You're just Jim. Because the reality is that Jesus wants to work through your life. And he doesn't define you by that one thing any more than we should. And understand this, that there is more to you that needs healing than just your sexuality. There is profound freedom in recognizing that people are not defined by that one thing of anything, that Jesus loves them and wants to move forward with them. So understand this, What's holding you back, what's keeping you bound up in unforgiveness is choosing to define one person by one or two or 20 things. Choose to realize that Jesus sees them as more than just that one thing. If you haven't seen the shack, you need to see it. And let me just give you this kind of side mention. Anytime Christians get fired up about something, read it or watch it. It's okay. Because usually it means there's something powerful there that we're just too self-righteous to see. And that is generally the case. That's a fantastic resource. The Shack, it's a movie. You should watch it or, or read the book. It's fantastic. It helps us understand that the people that hurt us are more than one-dimensional things. We have, a, a, we have a choice sometimes, and we see people through the myopic lens of our pain. And we only define them by their pain, by their mistakes. The third thing. That, that it helps us understand, realizes that holding you hostage is not setting me free. It realizes that, that that person that hurt you is more than just that one thing. And the third thing it does is like buying a couch. I know that doesn't seem related to it, but hold on a minute. Sheila and I, about a year ago, we're in, we're in Memphis and we're at Costco because Costco is where people go to buy ridiculous amounts of things, okay, in gigantic quantities. And we were at Costco, and we're walking through, and, and we see this couch that the girls and Sheila like, which is a magic moment when all the stars have aligned. Everybody likes everything. Now, here's the deal. Before that, for like 20 years, we've had a leather couch, which I like a lot. I like leather because I'm a guy, okay? And I don't know if you noticed this, but if in your, this is the case in your house, but estrogen must be directly connected to how cold a person feels, okay? So because every moment of every day, everyone in my house is freezing all the time, okay? They're always cold. And when you have leather furniture and women, they're always freezing sitting on the cold couch. So we saw this sectional couch, not a sexual couch, 
a section knoll couch. Like all lined up across there. And they said, we went, this is a great couch. And I said, well, okay, the price is right because it's like $800 for this couch. And I know that we could sell our couch for like $500. So this is the time to buy a, a couch because, first of all, everyone's happy. And Mother's Day is not the only day, right, when mama ain't happy. Ain't nobody happy, right? So, like, so we get the couch and we get it home. And Colin, my daughter's boyfriend, and I, we carried in the couch. And we got all these gigantic chunks, all the boxes. And, and the, the, the living room is just piled full of stuff. But you know what was still in the living room? The old couch. So like a smart person would have said, hey, let's take the old couch out and then bring the new couch in. But no, not this guy, right? Not the smartest human being you're going to meet because I got the old couch, the new couch, the boxes that the new couch came in, and a bunch of people who all have an opinion on where everything should go, right? Which is mayhem. This is exactly what happens in our life when we harbor this unforgiveness. We have to recognize that forgiveness begins by realizing that they, the person we're tethered to, they're not, they're not the key to our forgiveness, our healing. We have to understand that they occupy a space in our life where Jesus wants to be. They're like the old couch. We need to move them out so that Jesus can enter in and be the key to our healing. They are not the key to you getting better. We have to move them out of that space and invite Jesus into it. Otherwise, we'll never be able to experience what God has for us. So the bottom line, the next step, is articulate your pain. Not someone else's pain. Not the, not the like, hey, I'm mad for that person. You can't be mad for someone else. You can only be mad for you. You can only be hurt for you. How has it affected you that what you did made me feel worthless? What you made me feel was unfor, un, un, unvaluable, right? What you made me feel was betrayed. What you made me feel was unsafe. What you made, this happened to me. Articulate your pain and invite Jesus into it. Because holding on to them is not setting you free. Because just like you, they're defined by more than just their poor choices. And holding on to them is not the key to your freedom. Jesus is the key to your freedom. So here's the deal. I mean, I wish I could line you up and hand you all a t-shirt, you know, or a carnation, or a card, or something else. And those things are great for celebrating Mother's Day, but man, what I'd want for you for more than anything else is freedom. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for these folks. Thank you for moms, the example of selfless love that they are. Jesus, we just invite you into our pain. We just ask that you'd help us to take our next step today as we figure out where we're hurting and articulate it to you. And we ask that in your name. Amen.